tales for dark nights. She's Gone Written by Travis Coleman As narrated by Kaylin Scott Carter This recording was found in a house around suburbia, Colorado. A transcript has been prepared for inclusion in any reports. This is true. This can't be true. There's just no way it is possible. It is some mad dream. It must be. I, I can't. Oh, God. I can't do it. I can't breathe. <sighs> start from the beginning. That is the only way I can make sense of it all. <sighs> One year ago, I was a happily married man. My name is Ben. I have been married for quite some time, and I have a beautiful eight-year-old that looks just like her mother. My wife, Barbara, and I would spend hours just looking at our beautiful daughter, Karen. I still don't know how we made something so perfect. Eleven months ago, I was a widower, trying to raise a daughter on my own. It was a car accident that stole Barbara away from me. I like to blame the car accident for her death. But it was me. I killed her. <laughs> <laughs> I dedicated myself to raising Karen right. The first few months were the toughest. These past 11 months have been hellish, and I doubt they're going to turn better anytime soon. The first few weeks after the accident, Karen couldn't understand it. She asked all sorts of questions I never knew how to answer. She asked where had mommy gone, and I told her that she was in heaven. She wanted to know when she was coming back. And I tried to let her down as softly as possible. I told her that she's gone. She won't be coming back. She wept for a while, and the sounds that came out of her were so heart-rending that I almost broke down myself. I couldn't. I couldn't let Karen see me lose it. I had to be strong. She persisted with those questions for the first few months. I knew that she couldn't wrap her mind around the immovability of death. To be honest, I couldn't either. For the first few months, I would roll over in the morning, half expecting to see her angel-kissed auburn hair and an imperial visage on the pillow next to me before I would remember that she was gone. The mantra became my morning laud and evening vesper. She's gone. She's gone. She's gone. I can only describe my life after Barbara's death as living with a hole in your heart. It doesn't completely ruin your heart. It just serves as a constant reminder that there is something absent. I know I felt it, and I'm sure Karen experienced it. I kept taking care of my daughter but I stopped caring for myself. My hair has grown shaggy, and I can see strands of gray rising up in what once was an obsidian sea. My eyes are constantly ringed with a lack of sleep, and my features have taken on a sallow appearance. My once broad and proud face seems to now be constantly bent in self-defeat. Despite not caring for myself, I expended all my energy in caring for Karen. I made sure she was well-fed, attended school, and was emotionally cared for. Most of all, I made sure she felt loved. A day didn't pass where I didn't hug her or plant a kiss on the top of her head. The questions persisted daily. She wanted to know what happened to Mom. I couldn't tell her the full story. 
I could only manage the bits and pieces. We were driving home. There was an accident. And she was too hurt to survive her injuries. She made these questions an omnipresent part of our lives. I answered the questions as truthfully and frequently as possible. I think how I had my mantra and Karen had hers. They served to reaffirm that her mother was gone. It was three months ago that she asked a question that caught me off guard. I was tucking her into bed when she looked up at me and asked, What did mommy look like? After the accident, I had taken her very few photos and tucked them away. Looking at it was just too painful for me. But it wasn't until that moment that I realized how much it had impacted my daughter. She couldn't remember what her mother looked like. In my desire to guard myself against the pain, I had unintentionally deprived my daughter of a memory. I told her to get comfortable and I would be back in a second. I left and came back with a photo we had all taken a few weeks before the accident. I sat in the bed with her and wrapped my arm around her so she was in the crook of my arm and showed her the photo. Karen stared transfixed at the photo for a few moments, as if trying to memorize every feature and facet of her mom and my wife. I let her study the photo in her reverent manner for a few moments before I prepared to tuck her in. But she had one more question. What was mom like? I thought a moment before beginning. When I first met her, I was so shy. She had a part-time job in the library. When I first laid eyes on her, I knew I was in love. We were both in college, and I must have spent all of my freshman year looking at her over a book. I snuck glances at her and tried to work up my courage to speak to her. One day, when the library was empty, she came and sat down at the table where I was sneaking peeks and glances at her. She asked if I needed any assistance because I didn't look too good. I was about to ask what made me look sick, but she cut me off. Said, you look fine, but you've been reading that book upside down for an hour now. <laughs> we shared a laugh, and it was enough to break the ice for me to finally ask her out. She was a kind and beautiful woman. She had a way of smiling that would just light up a room. She was smart, was always able to see the answer to any question. She was the kind of person who gave and gave and never asked for anything in return. She gave me the greatest gift of all. Do you know what that gift was? She gave me you and made me the happiest man alive. I then planted a kiss on her forehead and I tucked her in. She asked me that question a few more times. I tried to tell her the little stories that encapsulated our happiness. I told her on her first date that culminated in her first kiss. I told Karen about her wedding and how the whole world seemed to be smiling and sunny. I told her of the happiest day of our lives, when she was born. It was after telling her one of these stories that she asked me a question that concerned me. She looked up at me with those stunning hazel eyes and asked, What if you could bring mommy back? That question caught me off guard. I paused for a few seconds, trying to think of how I should respond. The truth was that I felt like every passing day without Barbara was a struggle to keep my head above water. I would have given anything to see her one more time. I wanted to tell her that. But I couldn't. Instead, I told her, I loved your mother very, 
very much. But she is gone. Nothing will bring her back. She grew teary-eyed, but didn't cry. I tucked her in and resolved to take care into Barbara's grave. That weekend, we visited her grave. I was at the funeral, but Karen's grandparents had insisted on having her stay at their house for the funeral. They had chosen to pretend that their daughter had not passed away. They didn't attend the ceremony, and they watched over Karen while I went. I think it was partially to protect her from the knowledge of the finality of death. But I think it was also because they couldn't bear to see me. They blamed me for her death. I blame myself. I killed her. We knelt at the grave and I had Karen lay the flowers we had bought on the earth. I began talking to the granite. I had to explain to my daughter how people sometimes will talk at the graves of their loved ones. Tell them how they are doing or how much they mean to them. She asked me if she could talk and I nodded. I stepped away to give her some privacy. I stayed close in case I was needed. She reached forward and put her hand on the cold granite where the words, Barbara Jones, loving wife, caring mother, and adoring daughter were etched. Karen spoke. Mom, it's me, Karen. I love you. I miss you every day, and Dad does too. He cries sometimes. He thinks I can't hear him in his room. But I can. I wish she would come back to us. She wiped a tear away and stood up. I made myself look busy by looking at a nearby tombstone. It simply read Judith O'Day. I went home and I made myself a promise that I would take better care of myself. It was a week ago that I first caught Karen sneaking out. I was lying in my bed and listening to the sounds of our house settling when I heard the distinctive sound of her door being opened. I thought she was getting some water and would be back in her room in a couple of minutes. After a few minutes, I figured that she had returned and just forgotten to close the door. I drifted off and when I woke up in the morning to get her ready for school, I found her door closed and the backyard door unlocked. She had gone outside during the night. I questioned her as I drove her to school, but she just told me that maybe I had forgotten to lock the door that night. She had that guilty look in her eyes. I knew that she was lying. I assumed that she had gone out into the backyard or something, maybe to look for a doll or something, and forgotten to lock the door behind her. I resolved to try and be more vigilant. I stayed up the next night and waited for the sound of her door opening. After tucking her in, I sat in my bed and read while waiting for any sounds as she left her room. After a few hours, I decided to get a drink of water from downstairs. I remember that I was thinking that I was being foolish by waiting for Karen to try and sneak out when I should have just asked her what was going on. I don't think I was too worried. She was too young to be sneaking out to hang out with boys, drink, or smoke. She was a nine-year-old for crying out loud. It was when I was coming back upstairs with glass in hand that I noticed her bedroom door was open. The glass fell out of my hand and spilled on the floor. I had forgotten to close her door. She wasn't in her bed. She had gotten out of bed and walked by my room without waking me. My heart started to beat faster. I ran downstairs and found the backyard door that I had locked was now unlocked. My heart was beating a frantic staccato in my chest. I went out into the backyard, and the backyard gate was open. My heart almost stopped from the sudden shock of it all. Karen had left the house in the middle of the night, and now I had no clue where she was. I ran into the back alley that connected the houses in this suburb, hoping to find her, but she wasn't there. I thought of all the places she could have gone. All her friends lived at least five or more miles away. 
She wouldn't try walking that distance. There weren't any carnivals or fairs in town right now. I thought hard about where she could have gone, and then the realization of where she could have gone descended on my brain like a murder of ravenous crows. The cemetery. I broke into a dead sprint down the alley. It was only two miles between our house and the cemetery, but a lot can happen to a little girl in two miles in the dead of night. My mind raced and invented scenarios that could befall my sweet daughter in between here and there. I ran in the darkness without a flashlight, without having locked the door, without a thought in my mind than my little girl. I ran until my stomach felt like it was sloshing battery acid around. My legs were filled with pens and my lungs were trapped in a steel vise. I kept running. I found her at the gates to the cemetery. Karen saw me and tried to squeeze through the gates but I reached her in time. She cried, let me go, I want to talk to mom, I miss mom. The floodgates splintered and shattered and I pulled her to me and I broke down. I wept. I miss her too. I think that was the first time I had ever openly wept like that in front of her. We sobbed like that for a few minutes in each other's arms before I gathered her up and took her home. As we walked by the gates of the cemetery, I could have sworn I saw two men digging a grave in the center of the graveyard. I never knew that grave diggers worked that late. We made it home before 3 a.m., and I tucked Karen into bed. The next morning, Monday, I made a promise to take her to visit Barbara's grave every Sunday if she promised not to sneak out at night and try and visit her. She agreed, and I drove her to school. I took the day off work to root around the basement for my tools so I could fashion a deadbolt for the doors that was out of Karen's reach so she couldn't sneak out at night. I found everything I needed, but decided against putting up the deadbolts. I decided to trust that my daughter wouldn't try and sneak out. The next couple of days passed without any excitement. I took care of Karen. And I reassured her that we would visit my wife and her mother's grave that Sunday. The only thing that really stood out to me that week was a news report I caught the tail end of. Apparently, there were a string of crimes in which graves had been dug up and bodies were taken out of their coffins. I remembered the two men digging in the graveyard that night and knew that something shady was going on there. I was tempted to go to the police and file a report, but I decided against it. I didn't want to try and explain what I was doing out there that late at night. I think I was worried that the police might find me a negligent parent and take my Karen away from me. Everything seemed to happen all at once. That night, I was preparing to go to the cemetery with my daughter the next day. I took Karen in and sat in the bed reading, unable to go to sleep. I finally drifted off, but was woken up by my daughter shaking me and shouting something. She sounded like it was Christmas morning. I rubbed the sleep out of my eyes and asked her what she said. She spit out a rapid series of words that my sleep-stupid brain could barely process. She took off, and the last words she excitedly shouted hit me like a one-two punch to the solar plexus. Mommy is back. I rolled out of bed and made it downstairs to the kitchen just as Karen was fiddling with the door lock. Through the window in the door, I saw her. She was standing on the porch in the backyard. She was grubby and dirt clung to her hair in clumps. Her dress was soiled. She was leaning into the glass and I could see her facial features and her angel-kissed auburn hair. I gasped, trying to catch the breath that felt like it had been knocked out of me. I couldn't. It felt like something was preventing the air from going back into my lungs, and I dumbly realized that it must have been my heart that had leapt up in my throat. It was her. Karen unlocked the door, and before I could say anything, she swung it open and led her into the house. Memories and images beat around my brain. I remember the accident in vivid clarity. We had been celebrating Valentine's Day. I had had one too many drinks. She insisted on driving us home. 
I had my head out the window and was enjoying the cold, sobering wind swirling around my intoxicated head like a tempest. I pulled my head back in and got Barbara's attention. I caught her eyes and was telling her how much I loved her when the car hit a patch of ice. It slid, and for a second it looked like she had it under control before the car twisted sideways and shot off the road like a bullet fired from the gun of a vengeful god. We were weightless for a few moments before we slammed into a tree. The impact slammed my head into the dash and threw her through the windshield. I don't remember everything, but I can recall some images from that horrible night. My brain screams to me in painful images. Me, stumbling out of the car and finding her sprawled out on the ground. Me holding her in my arms while drunkenly and frantically screaming for help me watching hopelessly as she died in my arms. It was my fault. If I wasn't drunk, I would have been driving. If I didn't try and say something romantic to her, she would have been paying attention to the road. If I had been driving... It would have been me who had been tossed from the car through the windshield like a rag doll. Now she stood in the portal of the doorway in the same dress I had buried her in. She looked dazed and vacantly stared at the world around her. It was really her. My brain tried to make sense of it, but it couldn't. This was wrong. I wanted to say something, but my words rattled loose from my brain like a car losing control on the highway and smashing into a guardrail. More thoughts and words built up behind the initial thought and got caught behind my teeth in the mental carnage. The words and thoughts accumulated like cars in a pileup, and no matter how hard I tried to clear it up, the words would not tumble free. Before I could find the words to speak, Karen flew forward and right into her arms. The pale, dirty, gaunt, and malodorous Barbara leaned forward as if to embrace her daughter just before sinking her teeth into her neck. Karen was too shocked to do anything at first. She screamed as Barbara gnawed at the side of her throat where her shoulder met her neck. She tried to push her mother off her, but she was far too heavy and strong to be repelled so easily. She bit and chewed tenaciously at my daughter while everything unfolded before me like a nightmare that I had no influence or control over. That scream was enough to clear the blockage in my mind and galvanize me into action. I charged forward, roaring like a wounded animal, and seized Barbara by the shoulders and shoved her away from Karen with all of my strength. She came loose with a wet, tearing sound and slammed against the kitchen table. She bent backwards like she was going to topple over the wooden table before launching herself at me with snapping crimson teeth and horrifying groans that reeked of months worth of rot and embalming fluid. I caught her by the shoulders as she snapped and gashed her teeth with such force that I thought her teeth would shatter. I had to get rid of her in order to check on Karen. I slammed her into the back of the cabinet so hard that her back made a cracking sound before opening the door to the basement and throwing her down the stairs. She rolled down the stairs like a dervish of broken bones. I watched as she began to crawl up the stairs towards me. I slammed the door shut behind her. And that hurt the car. <laughs> she, she was lying on the ground with a small puddle of blood around her neck like a crimson halo. She twitched and spasmed on the floor as blood trickled out of her open wound. I slid across the linoleum and cradled her head in my lap. She looked at me, and in that stare, I felt something deep inside of me die. She died in my arms, looking up at my eyes, gurgling her last moments, still unable to make sense of why any of this would happen, unable to understand why her mother would do such a thing as bite her. I still don't know that answer. She came back five minutes later. Her eyes fluttered open, and for a brief moment, I thought it was her. 
She dashed at Hope when her mouth dropped open in a snarl and she leaned towards me. I pushed her away and regained my footing. I managed to lock her outside. She was always so light. I pushed her out the door and she fell off the porch. She righted herself and began to shamble back towards the house. But I had already closed and locked the door. I am not sure of anything anymore. I am sure of one thing, though. That thing is not my wife. That thing is no longer my daughter. They look like them. But they are not them. They are not them. They are not them. They are not them. And I am not me. I died with them. I am no longer myself. I am nothing but an empty husk waiting patiently for the end. I am waiting for the doors to give way. Do you hear them? I am waiting for the end. I am waiting to rejoin my Karen and Barbara. Those things should be through the doors any second now. I'm leaving this recording so you know what happened to us. I hope you can make more sense of this than me. Can't leave. Karen's gone. Barbara's gone. There's nothing left. I guess I am too. God, 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 God. Why You Can't Talk to the Dead, written by T.E. Parker. Performed by Melissa Exelberth. My aunt was a con artist, and she learned from the best. Her father. Grandpa never made it big, but he lived for the game. Staying under the radar was probably what made sure he never did get caught. Not once. He was so proud of that. Mom didn't take up the family business. She got religion instead and married a tax accountant. It's so ironic that it sounds like a joke, but it's true. My dad was the best for helping out with math homework. Mom's more colorful relations were kept at a figurative arm's length throughout my childhood, lest they corrupt me into following a more interesting life path. Aunt Cassie was the only one who could wiggle her way into my life. She was fully licensed as a psychologist, which made her a smidge more respectable. But Aunt Cassie used her ability to read a person in a whole different way one probably not intended by the university that issued her degree. Aunt Cassie was a bona fide psychic. She had a shop in everything, crystals, herbs, candles. Anything you needed to fill the mystic void in your life could be bought for a healthy markup at her little store. There was even a private room in the back that was used for readings and seances. Because both my folks worked, I would often get dropped off at the shop where I would help Aunt Cassie out with those little shows. Anything from messing with the lights to knocking on walls. Playing with the thermostat was my idea, and it was an effective one. Customers came to get chills down their spine, didn't they? Why not provide? Cassie helped me become the skeptic I am today. Showed me all the behind-the-scenes sleight-of-hand stuff. We'd watch daytime talk shows with magicians and mediums, and Cassie would explain every step from a basic rundown of cold readings to how to spot an audience plant. After one particularly convincing episode, I asked the natural question, Couldn't some of it be real? My aunt's reply was firm. The dead don't talk, kiddo. Anyone who claims otherwise is blowing smoke. It was her conviction more than anything that made me believe her. There was only one client I ever saw my aunt refuse. 
He was old, bald, and stooped, took his hat off when he came inside and twisted it in his hands as he talked. Cassie tensed up immediately when she saw him. The man claimed to have worked in the prison systems, death row. He'd been responsible for carrying out the final punishments of the worst convicted criminals on the planet. In his old age, this tormented him and aided his soul. He wanted Cassie to contact the souls of the ones he'd killed so he could apologize and beg forgiveness before he joined them. My aunt threw the most epic fit. I'd never seen her so mad. She hollered and threw things. Get out, she shouted. Out, 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 out. Shut up, get out. I hid under the counter with my hands over my ears until he left. Later, I thought her reaction was one of fear because of the man's job. An executioner has to be a con artist's worst fear. Eventually, I got found out. I put on a magic show for my folks, and because my mom missed my grandpa so much, I did a medium bit where I pretended to talk to him. Huge mistake. How stupid of me. My mother wasn't amused. Instead, she freaked out and banned me from seeing her sister ever again. I'd left some textbooks at the shop, though so I was allowed to run in and grab them while Mom fumed in the car outside. Aunt Cassie didn't even have to ask what was wrong. She could read my face, after all. I gave her a hug and a teary, snot-filled goodbye. She did tell me one last secret, though. Kiddo, there's a curse in this family that gets passed like a torch. I hope to whatever gods might be out there that I don't pass it on to you when I go. We didn't get to talk again for more than nine years. By that time, no parental ban could keep me from trying to reconnect. Still, it was awkward. Aunt Cassie had a tough go of life, diagnosed with a schizoid disorder that took her business from her. To pay bills, she'd gone legitimate, and with her business went all her zest and playful passion for life. One day, I returned home and found a message waiting in my inbox that made my stomach drop to the floor. I love you, kiddo. Remember what I told you. I dialed her number, already crying. No answer. I dialed again and again. I was too much of a mess to tell my mom. The police did that for me the next day. Car accident. Drunk driver. The funeral was a blur. Relatives I'd never seen in the flesh packed the church. I sat between my parents in the front row and racked my brain trying to figure out what it was my aunt wanted me to remember. We followed the hearse to the cemetery in dead silence. When the priest finished speaking, everyone took their leave. I stood a while, staring at the headstone, straining to recall something, anything about my aunt's last request. I drew blanks. If only Cassie hadn't been so cryptic. That's when I overheard someone say, We weren't expecting such a small turnout. It's a shame. Small turnout? That bothered me. The service had in fact been well attended. The church had practically been stuffed to the rafters. I turned around to say something and finally understood. Behind my parents stood a whole host of people all standing and staring dead ahead. My parents weren't paying them the slightest attention. The priest muttered his condolences and excused himself, walking right through the thick of the crowd without disturbing a single soul. At the head of the group, looking just as she did the day I'd seen her last, was Cassie. All of the rest-in-peace sentiment in the world wouldn't have done her any good. Her mouth was wide, wide open, and just like that, I knew. I know now what the family curse is. I know why the dead don't talk. They're too busy screaming. How I Became a Vegetarian Written by Common Grackle Performed by Ashley Tolfo. My ex-husband and I divorced on better terms than most. 
Frank was always a good father to our three-year-old son. And deep down, I think he still loved me. But truth be told, he was never that bright and a pretty huge pushover. That's why I was surprised, but not absolutely shocked when he came home one day to confess that he'd cheated on me with a coworker. He told me like a car salesman pitching a deal. It's not really cheating though, honey. Lola opened my eyes to everything. We're all just animals. Monogamy isn't natural. I didn't choose Lola over you. I'm choosing her and you, Frank said. His eyes were wide and his smile genuine. To my utter disgust, he believed what he was saying. I sent him packing that day. Fortunately for me, Lola didn't believe it was natural for her to raise another person's offspring, so I ended up with full custody of Henry without a fight. There was the occasional overnight visit at his dad's house, but I tried to keep them as limited as I could while still allowing Henry to have a relationship with his father. To be perfectly honest, I couldn't stand Lola. Not only was she a homewrecker, yes, I totally acknowledge that my ex had an equal part in cheating, but she was also batshit insane. I don't have anything against vegans in general, but Lola was a vegan on a militant level. When Henry asked his dad if he could have chicken nuggets for dinner during a visit, Lola had some choice words for him. We are animals too, Henry. We don't eat our own kind. It's wrong. You're little yet, so you can't be blamed. But your mommy is a bad, bad mommy if she lets you eat our poor murdered sisters and brothers. This broke my little Henry's heart, and he made Frank call me to pick him up. Naturally, his father didn't try to correct Lola's words, coward as he was. Am I bad, Mommy? He asked on the drive home. No, honey, no. You're such a good boy. Lola's crazy, I said. He reached his hand to my arm from his booster seat behind me. You're not a bad Mommy. He said, tears welling up in his eyes. You bet I bought that kid chicken nuggets on the way home. I was ready to wring that woman's neck. But instead, I tried to be the adult and called my ex to explain why what happened was unacceptable. He agreed with me and promised it wouldn't happen again. But the thing is... He always agrees with the person talking to him. I wasn't necessarily reassured that the issue wouldn't happen again, but I did feel better after giving him a piece of my mind. It was about a month later that the break-in happened. When I got home after picking Henry up for daycare, we found our house absolutely trashed. I took Henry back to the car and called the police. Once the officers had given us the all clear and verified no one was still in the house, I left Henry in front of my laptop with a snack and my neighbor Totoro playing and went to speak to the cops. The house looked completely ransacked and there was a good deal missing. Most notably, my kitchen was pretty much emptied. I had been a bit of an amateur chef for a while and had a great deal of quality cookware. My all-clad, Le Creuset, Noritake, and Crock-Pot brand cookware and dishes had all been stolen, along with my carefully chosen Wusthof knife set and all of my flatware. It was surprising to me what the thieves had chosen to take, but the cops explained that in robberies, often what is easiest to pawn is what is taken. My laptop would have been too easily traceable, 
and my TV was too big to take in a time crunch. As the police took their photos and I began my list of stolen items to turn into my insurance company, my heart sank deep into my stomach. Our cat, Penelope, hadn't greeted us yet. I dropped my notebook and began searching the house. Here, kitty kitty. I called from room to room with increasing desperation. No cat answered my call. My fears were confirmed after I had checked the last of Penelope's usual hiding places. Our cat was gone. The police told us there was nothing they could do about the cat. It was most likely that she had simply escaped while the robbery was taking place. Naturally, Henry was devastated. We posted flyers around the neighborhood and checked regularly with local animal shelters, but nothing came of it. Penelope was an indoor cat and didn't have an identifying tag or even a collar. Frank was surprisingly supportive during our recovery from the theft and pet loss. He brought dinner for us that night. It was vegan, but the thought was nice, and even slept over on the couch because Henry was scared the bad guys might come back. I was pretty impressed with the way Frank stepped up in our time of crisis. So when he told me that Lola wanted to have a dinner, just me and her to clear the air, I said I'd think about it. After all, I was an adult and could just leave as she started acting crazy. Over a month passed since the robbery, and there was no sign of the cat and no official invitation from Lola. Not that we hadn't heard from her entirely. She had sent Frank over with a piece of meteorite that she claimed would protect us from any further misfortune. Although, I wasn't sure what information she was basing that belief on. Included with the meteorite was a note explaining that we shouldn't be sad our cat got out because keeping a pet locked up in a house is wrong. She even went so far as to say the thieves probably took it upon themselves to free Penelope from the tyranny of man. What a comforting and thoughtful gift, right? I'd nearly forgotten about Frank's request that I consider a dinner with her when I got a text from a number I didn't have saved in my phone. Would you like to have dinner with me tomorrow? It would be cruelty-free, of course. I hope that doesn't offend you. I'd give you three guesses at who sent the text, but I bet you'd only need one. Eating vegan didn't offend me, but her text definitely got my dander up. Fortunately, I was too tired to worry much about the text or how bitchy it was. Dealing with the insurance company to replace our stolen items was becoming a second job in itself, and I was not up for an argument. Sure, we can have dinner, I typed back. See you at 5.15, she said. There was no way I was going to subject my son to another meal with Lola, so I made arrangements to drop Henry off at his grandparents for a sleepover. They were happy to have him for the night, and Henry was able to get his mind off of his still-missing cat. It was a win-win. For them, at least. I still had to suffer through dinner with crazy. Repeating over and over to myself that keeping a good relationship with Frank, and therefore Lola, was important to my son's mental health. I set off to my ex's house. When I got there, I was surprised to see how normal the meal looked. Despite how obnoxious she was, Lola had clearly made an effort to create a passable meal substitute for our dinner. While the food passed for normal, the home decor certainly didn't. A large chart showing the locations of the chakras was painted on the wall. Each chakra had its own shelf with a brightly colored rock on it. No wall was painted the same color as the next with the kitchen slash dining room being bright yellow, blue, green, and orange. 
The table was low to the ground and deep purple, with pillows to sit on instead of chairs. Candles of every possible shape and color sat on any available flat surface. If this were anyone else's home, I might have considered it to be a quirky fun style. But it was Lola's. So I considered it a testament to her crazy personality instead. Frank won't be joining us for dinner. He had to stay late at work, she said. She ushered me toward a cushion and gestured for me to sit. I'm so glad you could come. I know this isn't the most ideal situation for us, and I thought it would be nice if we could, like, find some common ground, you know? She asked. Common ground? Like what? I asked. Like, I don't know. Maybe you could try not eating our fellow animals? She said. There it was. The Lola we all know and hate. Look, I'm fine with you being vegan. But I'm not. And you're just gonna have to be okay with that. I said, trying to keep my voice as calm as possible. Can we just talk about something else? Maybe you'll change your mind. Someday, she said. I rolled my eyes. Doubt it. Okay, sorry for bringing it up. Let's eat before everything gets cold. I made it special for you, she said. We sat in awkward silence for a while as we ate. I was relieved she was no longer proselytizing, but it was starting to get really uncomfortable. This honestly tastes a bit like real meat. The texture is even spot on, I said. I was actually pretty impressed that beans and soy could be transformed so well. Lola hadn't touched her meat substitute yet, and instead picked daintily at her salad. Oh, it is real, she said. Her voice was casual, as if this was the most normal thing in the world to say. You cooked meat? I asked. I was sure I had misunderstood. Oh, yeah. I didn't know how else to get you to understand, she said. Understand what, exactly? Is this the common ground you're working on? I asked. Yep, exactly. I just needed a way to show you how wrong it is to eat meat, she said. So, you made meat? I asked. Her explanation made no sense. Yeah, but this meat you should recognize. I made it special for you, so you could see how sad it is when an animal is killed just to be eaten, she said. Lola was smiling from ear to ear. Why don't you cut off another slice for yourself? She asked happily, handing me a knife. Not just any knife, though. A Wusthof knife. My Wusthof knife. Complete with the dent I'd made in the handle two years ago. She must have seen the recognition on my face because she added, People who use cookware for murder don't deserve to have it. I'm sure you'll understand. She made a frowny face. Or can the big bad carnivore not do it? Different when it's an animal you knew personally, huh? 
she asked. Penelope. Bile rose in my throat as I ran to the bathroom. My head filled with images of Lola murdering and cooking my cat. Tears ran down my face as I violently retched into the toilet. That's when I saw it. The dried drips of blood down the sides of the pink bathtub. I wasn't sure if I could handle what was beyond the curtain. But wanting to know for sure. To have proof to show Frank how monstrous Lola was. I ripped the curtain back. Blood rushed through my ears. And my breath stopped in my lungs. Yet somehow, a scream ripped through my throat. There in the bathtub, with empty caverns carved out where muscles used to be, lay the corpse of my ex-husband. Lola is now doing life in prison, but it will never feel like justice was completely served. How can any punishment she receives ever make up for Henry losing a father? Or the unending nightmares I will endure for the rest of my life? Penelope eventually made her way home. But what is a cat to a boy who has lost his father? During the court proceedings, Lola freely admitted to what she had done. <laughs> I bet you won't eat meat anymore now, will you? <laughs> this was the last thing she said to me screaming out the words as she was led away by prison guards. She seemed so proud of herself. As much as I don't want her to have that satisfaction. She's right. I'll never eat meat again. Meal Deal by Ian Sputnik Read by Kristen Holland Albert James Kinlock and his wife Dorothy sat at their dining table and went through the options. Ooh, how about this one? Dot suggested. The nag's head. Let's have a look, love, he replied, taking the latest issue of the Real Ale Drinker's Guide from his wife. No, 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 come on, love, it's part of a chain. We need to get to the real pubs, not these silly mock ones. The ones which have been bought out by these big companies are soulless. They're so busy and full of tourists, and not what we're really looking for. I'm sorry, honey, you're right, of course. Perhaps this isn't the guide we really need to be reading. Eureka! Bert shouted, which made Dot almost jump out of her skin. What on God's earth? So sorry, my sweet, he apologised. Listen to this. Off the beaten track. Proper drinking taverns for proper drinking people. This looks like the perfect guide. No chains, no high streets, no all-day breakfasts, and hopefully no damn jukebox. Proper old taverns frequented by proper old locals. Inbred is well-bred, after all. Dot chuckled along at his little quip. Sounds perfect. Where can we get a copy? There's a phone number. Love, where's the bank card? Bert was a distinguished-looking man. His hair was short and neat, albeit slightly peppered. He was tall and trim. His face was wizened, although not too old-looking. In fact, you would be hard put to guess his age, just a number to Bert, and not a particularly important one at that. His wife was much the same, minus the peppered hair colouring. Hers was a magnificent Titian, immaculately kept. Together, they made for a very handsome couple in the twilight years of their lives. Within a week, Dot shuffled into the living room, where Bert was finishing off his bacon sandwich and cup of tea. It's here, she shrieked excitedly, smacking down the large envelope. Bert spared no time in tearing the guide from its packaging. Together, they perused the pages. 
Within five minutes, both their gazes were drawn to an article. Man of Kent was the headline. A traditional pub away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. This drinking establishment stocks an exceptional range of real ales and ciders from small independent breweries within the UK and Europe. The little watering hole is a trek and a half to gain access to, miles from the local train station and only served by a none too frequent or reliable bus service. But if you've got the resolve to get there, then you won't be disappointed. A perfect start to our mini tour, Bert announced. Dot agreed. They decided to make the journey on Friday night. Friday always being the best night for a good drink, they both agreed. They also made a special effort to get an early night on Thursday in preparation for the long and arduous trip ahead of them. Come Friday, their little home was a den of activity as Bert gathered waterproof clothing and packed it in their little travel backpacks together with maps, timetables and the like. Dot made sandwiches for the journey and two flasks of hot drinks. Just before they left, she reminded him of the marking papers. You'd forget your head if it weren't screwed on, she complained. Then... They were on their way. The journey from Essex was rather long. The onward trains from London to Kent took even longer. They had to change at least three times, and when they got to the little railway station in Kent, they discovered that the bus service for Friday had been cancelled due to mechanical problems. Oh well, Bert said in a resigned voice. Looks like we're walking the rest of the way, love. He reached into his backpack and retrieved one of the maps. Shouldn't take that long, he assured his wife. Dot smiled back at him. They had been together for an age and a half, or so it seemed, so an hour or so walk wouldn't make much difference. Although the walk was long, it was not unpleasant. The roads meandered through some of the nicest countryside in Britain. Huge meadows and farmland, as far as the eye could see. This was the Garden of England, after all, for that is what the country of Kent had been nicknamed. There was a natural calmness to the area. Apart from the occasional squawk of a crow, all was completely silent. It was October, and the clouds were dark and low. Rain seemed imminent. Bert hoped that they would make it to their destination before the heavens opened up, and his wife, obviously, agreed. After getting lost once or twice, Bert pointed and shouted, There it is! In the distance, on an otherwise deserted little road, one dimly lit building shone out like a beacon of hope. Within five minutes... They entered the little oasis. The place was nigh on deserted, which Bert and Dot were not particularly bothered about. They preferred to sample a pub's wares in relative quietness. They only needed a few people to frequent an establishment to help give it the atmosphere that they sought. Good evening, sir, the landlord said in a welcoming voice. Looks like you made it just in time. I think the weather's just about going to take a turn for the worse. What will it be? Bert and Dot took several moments to peruse what beverages were on offer. I'll have a pint of old driver, and the wife will have half a mantis. That'll be five pound thirty, replied the landlord. Bert reached into his trouser pocket and pulled his wallet loose. It took some doing due to the girth of the leather pouch, and when he opened it, the landlord could see why. It was completely stuffed full with a large wad of notes. From what he could see, there must have been quite a few hundred pounds, maybe thousands. Bert offered him one of the notes. I'm so sorry, he apologised, but a twenty is the smallest I have. Planning on making a long session of it, are we, sir? The landlord joked. What? Oh, no, I see. No, no, no. The good wife and I are starting on a week-long tour of little independent inns, like your own fair establishment, so we can sample the flavours of local brews. This will be just one stop of many in our sortie into the Kent countryside. After paying, Bert struggled to squeeze the wallet back into his pocket and rejoined his wife, who was sitting waiting patiently at a small table in one of the pub's small alcoves. The time was about 5pm, and although not yet night, the gathering dark storm clouds gave the feeling that the hour was much later. After three drinks, Bert offered the landlord one. Well, thank you, kind sir, he responded. The other half a dozen local drinkers who had regarded the two non-locals with nothing but disdain since the moment they had arrived eyed Bert up and down. They chuckled quietly amongst themselves. I'll bring him over to you, he offered. He approached Bert and Dot with all three drinks on a tray and joined them, after asking if that was okay. He then initiated conversation with these two new, jumped-up strangers, 
although he didn't call them that to their faces. Where had they come from? How did they get here without the bus running? Where were they staying that night? And so on. Don't your family and friends worry about you two out and about at your ages, if you don't mind me asking? Not that I'm suggesting that you're too old to be out on your own, he inquired. Well, sir, Bert made to reply. Oh, please, call me Jerry. Sorry, but Jerry, the fact of the matter is, we were never blessed with children. And as for friends, well, we rather like to keep ourselves to ourselves. Thought that we might board here for the evening, if you have a room that isn't booked. Well, as you can see, we're not exactly in peak season at the moment. He then let out a small chortle. As he said so, Jerry looked over his shoulder to the small group of locals who were now gathered around the nearest corner of the serving counter. They laughed as well. Jerry probed and probed more about their plans, and Bert answered as best he could. Excuse me, please, Jerry apologised. Just a little bit of business to attend to, he explained as he looked over to the woman who had recently taken over his serving duties. Bert and Dot presumed that this new arrival must be his wife. Bert rejected his apology, explaining that they had probably taken up too much of his time anyway, and it should be them apologising to him. Jerry, in return, offered them both a drink on the house. It's a pleasure to talk to you, he explained. We don't get too many strangers passing through here, and I'll only be a moment anyway. I'll just see about that room for you while I'm at it. Jerry approached the bar and muttered a few words into his wife's ear. She nodded and, looking over to the old couple, smiled sweetly before starting to pour the drinks. Within a few moments, Jerry returned with the refreshments. Nah, get that down, you both. As they drank, Jerry's wife made her way to the customer's side of the bar and proceeded to start shutting the curtains. The chat in the pub ceased, and silence seemed to fill the room. As the curtains were being drawn, one of the local men walked over to the door and pulled across the heavy metal bolt at the top and then the bottom. He also turned the hanging sign from open to closed before pulling a curtain across the door. Bert and Dot stood up and retrieved their bags from the floor. They then slowly retreated into the farthest corner of the pub. Perhaps we'd best be on our way after all, Bert said. The couple then reached into their bags and hurriedly started putting on their raincoats and waterproof trousers. We've got friends quite nearby who are expecting us. I'm sure they won't mind putting us up for the night as well. Don't want to put you to any trouble. Well, you see, that's not really true. But, is it? Jerry replied. See, you've already told me exactly what I needed to know. You keep yourselves to yourselves. No close friends. No family. So nobody's expecting you at all, are they? The landlord's manner had suddenly changed, and not for the better. And as for trouble, well, seems like you've got enough of that yourselves, haven't you? If it's our money you're after, just take it, Dot offered. No need for any violence. Not as easy as that. A large grin spread from ear to ear across Jerry's face. Can't really have you two go telling tales now, can we? So you might as well take them coats off, because you ain't going anywhere. Not now. Not ever. The rain is the last of your worries, my newest best friends. He cackled. With that, Jerry and the locals began to bear down upon them, several of them now openly brandishing knives. One put a show of slowly passing his blade across his own throat in a mock representation of their intentions. Things aren't being too easy round here, you see. That fair wad of notes will pay my rent on this place for a few months, and the boys here... We'll get a bit of pocket money out of it as well. Well, we gave you every chance to do the decent thing, Bert said. And for your information, the waterproofs we've put on aren't to keep the rain out. It's to keep the blood off our clothes. Blood can be such a tiresome thing to remove, don't you think? As Jerry and his gang of thugs looked at each other with a mixture of amusement and bemusement, both Bert and his wife dropped to the floor. The skin from their faces split open as enlarged canine jaws, complete with razor-sharp teeth, burst forth. Their fingers stretched into claws and their ears into long, hairy points. Jerry had not even the time to make a sound as Dot made the first lunge. She was on him in an instant. 
the gang of locals were frozen in pure horror as blood spurted up the walls and across the ceiling. Her face burrowed deep into his guts as she fed hungrily. One of the gang shook himself from his stupor and headed for the door, but he was too slow. In a single bound, the creature that had once been Bert was blocking his exit. In one snap of his jaws, the local drinker's head was separated from his body. It rolled across the floor, leaving a trail of blood as it went. Screaming and panic ensued, with blood spraying liberally around the room as limbs were severed in a frenzy of snapping jaws and swiping claws. The landlady was the last local standing. She had backed herself into a corner and screamed pleas of mercy to the approaching pair of beasts. They paused for a brief moment before looking at each other and letting out mocking, hyena-like laughter. They pounced. The creatures that were formerly Bert and Dot then spent the evening gorging on flesh and lapping up the blood as it flowed freely from the corpses that lay broken and dismembered around the public house. They then settled on the crimson-soaked floor and groomed each other's faces to remove any last morsel of human remains. After such a feast, they then fell into a comfortable sleep. Come morning, the couple awoke back in human form. They removed their waterproof PVC coats and trousers, and Dot took them to the toilets to rinse off the blood. Bert, in the meantime, took the opportunity to empty the pockets and wallets of locals. He then emptied the till of the evening's takings. Finally, he sat at the table that had received the least in the way of blood and gore soiling, and retrieved one of the marking papers from his backpack. Dot joined him within a few minutes. So what do you think? asked Bert. I would say a slightly woody taste with a hint of assholes, she replied. They laughed in unison as Bert filled in, man of Kent, slightly woody with undertones of asshole. Before leaving, Bert made his way into the kitchen and turned the gas hob on. After turning each knob to maximum, he lit a small fire in the bar area and joined his wife outside. They then made their way slowly but purposefully to the train station. It was still dark, but thankfully not raining. Once they arrived, they found that they had at least three quarters of an hour before the first train of the day was due to arrive. This gave them ample opportunity to pick their next destination. So, what's the next drinking hole, my lover? Dot asked. How about the Mackland Arms in Raynham? Ooh, farming stock, she cooed. They always have a nice, earthy aftertaste. She then noticed that Bert gave a slight shiver. Oh, honey, I think I've got just the thing to ward off a chill before it starts. She retrieved the two flasks that she had prepared and packed the day before, unscrewed them, and peered into each. A slight waft of steam escaped from both as the contents came in contact with the frigid early morning air. Oh, good, still nice and warm, she gushed. This'll put hairs in your chest. After smelling each, she asked, a, B negative or O positive, dear? Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce Bert Bumblefoot. This is a small plush toy that I bought for my two-year-old son, and it has absolutely ruined my fucking life. Let me explain. As all parents know, Small children can seem like anomalies of nature. Just when you think you understand your child, your own flesh and blood, they turn around and do something so weird that you start questioning your own personality. When my firstborn, who is now nine, went from quietly playing with soldiers in the front yard to picking up dog shit off the ground and throwing it directly at my wife's face, I started questioning whether or not I should be contributing to the gene pool. The two-year-old, however, didn't seem odd until very recently. I don't really like the idea of giving out his name on the internet, so let's call him Toby. Toby is one cute little kid. He's always smiling, wanting to play, real positive and enthusiastic. A little hyper, like his older sister, but my wife and I are able to handle him. He was like this until I gave him Bert Bumblefoot two weeks ago. Bert Bumblefoot is a small doll made from crochet that looks like a boy with black hair and a red jacket. 
with one of its feet twisted in a certain way. It's actually a pretty cute toy. The woman that I bought it from told me that this type of doll is called an amigurumi, and making them is a Japanese art. See, I had been out at a flea market looking for an anniversary gift for my wife, and during my search I found a small table with a bunch of dolls in this Japanese style. Each one was a specific character, and the old lady running the table had a booklet that explained the doll's personalities and traits. It was super sweet. The booklet for Bumblefoot is sitting in front of me as I write this. It reads, Say hello to Bert Bumblefoot. Bert is a little boy with a bumbly foot. Because of this, he walks around all limpy and always loses races. He needs a home where he can be loved and played with, although he sure wishes he had a normal foot again. I thought the toy would be perfect for Toby, so I bought it and brought it home for him. At first, he didn't really care for it. I wasn't offended or anything. Kids are kids, and it was just a cheap doll. However, a couple days later, I found old Bert had joined Toby's main crew of toys along with his G.I. Joe, Iron Man, and Godzilla figures. Toby always liked to carry his few favorite toys around the house, as if they were some kind of gang that accompanied him as he went about his business. But with Bert, he started making even more special exceptions. He would bring the little doll to dinner, keep him in his pocket when we'd go out, etc. Every time we asked him if he wanted to go to the playground, get pizza, or just take a walk outside, he'd say the same thing. Let me get Bert Bobafoot! Soon, I started having a recurring dream about Toby playing with the Bert doll in his room with someone on the floor. The person accompanying my son in these dreams, whose voice sounds much like a man's, is always lying down with his feet twisted into impossible positions. This strangely shaped person is always mummified from head to toe in red yarn, with the exception of one of his eyes. The dreams only end when the yarn man's eye meets my own. Toby's older sister started to get a little jealous of how much time her brother was playing with the doll, and she asked for one of her own. My wife and I took a drive out to the flea market, but the woman who sold it wasn't there. Her entire booth was gone. I asked the other vendors, but none of them could tell me where she went. So I did what any normal person would do. I asked the internet. I posted on a couple forums asking for help finding any line of dolls carrying the Burt Bumblefoot character. No replies. Life went on for a few days, and Toby started acting stranger. Going to bed earlier, acting less active than usual. It was as if he was going through an existential crisis at the age of two. It was weirding me and the rest of the family out. So one day, we decided to all go into his room, my wife, my daughter, and I, and play with Toby. He seemed like his usual self after about an hour of playing with his toys. Then we got the phone call. Not a call on an ordinary phone, mind you. This was a call from a little Sesame Street toy that used to be my daughter's that Toby had taken once she was too old for it. It was a play phone that had Elmo talk to you. That day, Toby picked it up, pressed a number, and a man's voice came out. It wasn't in English, so I don't know exactly what it said, but there was something about it that made me feel uneasy. What made me even more uneasy was what Toby had said to us immediately after it spoke. That's for you! It's Burr Bobafoot! I was pretty shaken, but my wife kept insisting it was probably just a manufacturing error. I don't believe it is, so I recorded myself playing with the phone. You can listen for yourself here. <laughs> <laughs> the voice always talks when you press the two twice. Last night, Toby was acting even weirder. Throughout dinner, he barely spoke and kept staring out at nothing as if in extremely deep thought. My daughter said they were playing in her room before dinner and he had stopped abruptly, as if something freaked him out. Thinking he was sick, I picked him up and took him to bed. On my way there, I saw the doll ripped in half in the hallway. I went back into his bedroom and asked him why he tore apart his doll. 
He didn't say anything. He just stared at me. I took the poor, torn Bumblefoot and my heart sank when I saw that whoever had made the doll had gone through the trouble of sewing yarn innards into it. Alright. That was it. Something was super fucked up about this doll and I was going to figure out what. I went back on my computer and found, to my surprise, that someone had actually replied to one of the questions I had posted about Bert Bumblefoot days ago. Here is his message. Hi there. You seem like a nice enough person, so I'm gonna tell you right now that you need to put that Bumblefoot doll someplace where you can keep an eye on it. That thing in your house isn't actually a doll. In all likelihood, it's probably a full-grown Japanese adult. The doll is just a capsule, a storage unit. You're not going to believe me, but that's not my business. I'm letting you know all this so I can say I tried to help you. There are services offered all over the world that a vast majority of people will never know about. Fucked up services that shouldn't exist. Acted out by sociopaths messing with shit that was never meant to be messed with. Things like tampering with consciousness, taking it out of people, putting it into other people. There's a Japanese company. I use that term very loosely. Think of it more like a cult that's run like a business called Richidoru. They get into contact with people who are sick, deformed, or unhappy with who they are. Provide a very specific service. The process, from what I know, is taking a person's thoughts and placing them into a specifically manufactured doll. The doll takes up these loose thoughts and feelings and soaks them up, like a sponge. The dolls are sold across the world. Those undergoing the process are asked their preference, and the person's thoughts are ringed and leak into someone else, usually children. Children are more susceptible to this process, so it only makes sense to market these little soul sponges as toys. Every toy is different to fit the needs of the person being placed into it. The mind is used to being refined to the body, so it makes sense to be put into something that is at least a little familiar to it. From the description you gave of your Bumblefoot toy, this is probably some man who had some foot deformity and used Richidoru to get a second chance. I know this because my sister did it five years ago. She lives with me now in a body that doesn't belong to her. I resent her every day for stealing the form of someone she doesn't know, and I myself am looking for a way to reverse the process. It's the only right thing to do. I hope you take action so the same doesn't happen to your son. After that, there was another message sent by this individual. Oh shit! I almost forgot. Don't let anything happen to the doll. If your son gets kicked out of his body, he's gonna need a vessel to go into for the time being. You don't want him to be leaked everywhere. Otherwise, there may not be anything to bring back. My sister almost destroyed her doll. I have it locked away so she can't add murder to her list of atrocities she's committed in her journey to feel normal. That's what this company does, man. They take broken people, encourage their victim mentalities, and do awful things to whoever they consider normal. I am now sitting at my desk, as I have been all day, trying to piece together the torn up Bumblefoot doll. Toby has been asking about where his toy is, but I keep telling him I've thrown it away. I don't think he believes me. He keeps trying to come into my office, get a look at what I'm doing. I want to think it's my kid, but it isn't. He's not walking like he usually does, or talking like he usually does. It's like watching a puppet with an unfitting puppeteer. What really convinced me, however, was my dream last night. In it, I was in Toby's room. He was playing with Bert Bumblefoot and the Yarn Man again. Only this time the Yarn Man was unwrapped. He was a tall, gaunt Japanese man. Humorless. Frightening. Across from him, playing with the toy, was my kid. And he was, from head to toe, covered in red yarn. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights